like each rodeo to be a voyage of discovery, and this week we've come to a place which has close ties to some epic journeys of exploration. Welcome to Dundee. <laughs> interesting little fact. Did you know at one time there were more millionaires in Dundee than any other part of Britain? And it's all down to this, jute, harvested from a plant in India. Now, it may not look like much, but it was one of the most familiar products of the 19th century. This is how it came out of the plant in its natural form. And it then went through a variety of processes to be used in all sorts of things like string, rope, cloth, sailcloth, flooring, clothes, and it was all made here in Dundee. Some 50,000 people worked in the industry. Not surprisingly, it made some individuals very wealthy, including Jute Baron, Sir James Caird. Caird, like everyone in Dundee, watched the exciting launch of this ship the discovery on its maiden voyage in 1901 to Antarctica. Below deck, it's easy to imagine life on board. Basic, with few home comforts. This is the captain's cabin. Robert Falcon Scott was appointed expedition leader. Scott of the Antarctic, of course. And he was immensely courageous. It's incredible to think that on its maiden journey, this ship was stuck in the ice for three years before it was rescued. Sir James Caird was so impressed by the bravery of the men on the Discovery that he later helped fund Shackleton's epic journey on the Endurance to the Antarctic via the South Pole. As we know, it became one of the most incredible adventure stories of all time when the expedition became stranded on the ice. Just when things looked hopeless, Shackleton launched a heroic mission to get help on a lifeboat. That lifeboat was named after Sir James Caird, and it saved their lives. Sir James Caird left many legacies here in Dundee. He funded the construction of this magnificent hall, Caird Hall, which is the venue for our journey into the uncharted waters of today's roadshow. I try very hard not to forget a face, and apparently I've met this lady before, um, and the occasion, I'm told, was my last visit to Dundee with the Antiques Roadshow, which was, believe it or not, way back in 1982. Yes. Is that right? That is correct, Okay. Yes. So, uh, it wasn't you that I met all those years ago, was it not? No, it was a gentleman. Okay. It was an elderly gentleman friend, mm -hmm. and that's who had given me the figurine, and she's absolutely beautiful. Well, I, I think we'll concur on that one. Whenever I look at figurines of this nature, there are several things I look for. One is the facial detail, and she's got a nice face. She's got a lovely face. Um, she's got a very well sculpted figure and torso, it goes without saying. Um, and even little things like um, the uh, uh, feet. I mean, the fact that her toenails have all been very carefully, carefully carved. The actual construction obviously makes use of, of bronze and ivory. Mm -hmm. and it, this is a theme that seems to have become very popular um, during the sort of early part of the 20th century and, and then into the 20s and the 30s. And there, there are big names uh, involved here, um, Chiparus and Colline and, and Ferdinand Priest. But, but yours is actually signed by somebody called Bartolome. Yes. Um, who's, who's a lesser known maker, um, very competent. Uh, you've only got to look at the quality of the carving mm. to see that this is obviously a craftsperson. So there she is. At the moment, this type of figure is very, very popular. 
Um, they seem to have been discovered by the Russians. Um, and the criteria, as far as the Russian buyers are concerned, is to some degree dictated by flesh. So if you're showing more than a little bit of, 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 uh, of ankle, that's always a bonus. And in this case, you're showing, you know, um, more than most women would. In Quite a bit more, exactly. yes. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very, very delicate. It's a delicate situation, this, isn't yes. it? Yes. Um, so, um, back in 1982, what price was put on this figure? From memory, what my friend told me, it was about, maybe about 1,500 to 2,000. 1,500 to 2,000. I think something like that. Well... With all those Russians chasing this uh, this particular scantily clad maiden today, there's every chance that this figure uh, could make some in the region of between three to four thousand pounds. Oh, very nice, lovely. <laughs> that is nice to know. Here we are, Edinburgh Castle Peep Show, absolutely splendid in three languages. The, the Chateau of Edinburgh in French, Das Schloss in German, and the Castle of Edinburgh. So it was designed for tourists, really. Now, I'm going to ask you to help me open this, because it's a lovely peep show. Let me... I know I've got it open. You hang on to the bottom, and if we go through it, we can see the whole streets of Edinburgh, and it's vibrant in its colour. And I can see somebody in a... Well, it looks like a kilt at the end there. Is that yes. right? Yes, that'll, yes. That'll be... In the grass market in, in Edinburgh. I was there the other day, and I have to say, I don't recognise the uh, this building here on the left. I don't recognise that, but the others are are completely clear. That's the back of the castle. Yes. And 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 that ca castle terrace here, and the old high street goes down uh, from here. Yes. Toward, towards Holyrood. The Royal Mile. Royal Mile. The Royal Mile. So, tell me, where did you buy this wonderful thing 40 bought, years ago? I bought it in uh, more, of, more of a junk shop than an antique shop in Perth. Yes. And when I came across this, I just couldn't resist it. Well, I couldn't resist it either. I mean, apart from the box being rather tatty, um, the inside is as bright and as vibrant as ever. That's because it's been kept out of the dust, yeah. and it's been handled with care. Nowadays, something like that... You'd be paying somewhere in the region of six or seven hundred pounds. Oh, really? Yes, absolutely. I didn't expect that. <laughs> so there you are. There you are. You've done rather well. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank bringing you. it in. So, what is a nice lady like you doing with an extraordinary carriage lot like this? But it was part of a collection my father had. All his pieces were not naughty pieces like this, but it just happened to be the nicest one I like to look at and play with when I was young. Later on, I was able to take only one piece from our house with me because things were getting very dangerous in Germany where I grew up, close to the end of the war, and my parents by this time were no longer with me, and I just grabbed this and fled. How extraordinary. And were, the, were the Russians advancing at this time? Yes, yes. Were they really? Very closely, yes. And how, but how did you manage to get out? Well, but you just stood by the end of the road and hoped for a lift, which I got eventually from a, a German military bus. And this, of course, being a small little carriage. Yes, I had it in my coat pocket. Yes, fantastic. Yes. And do you remember it in your childhood? Yes, yes. It, I, as far as I remember, it never went. I mean, it was never... Uh, looked upon to get your time. It was just a piece, yes. of an ornament, you know. <laughs> but it does have most extraordinary panels, the yeah. enamel yes, panels, yes, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yes, yes. My father must have fancied the panels. Yes, I suspect that's probably... It's, just, it's got a little bit of a mail. My daughters, they tell me now that as when they were a little, they used to have a look at it and giggled and thought, you better not let mum know we're looking at these <laughs> naked ladies, you see. <laughs> hey, that's terrific. Yeah. Well, um, it's a very pretty little Swiss carriage lock. Yes. Um, with silver gilt construction of case, made around 1915, 1920, that sort of yes. period. Yes. And, of course, the, the great feature about it are these lovely enamel panels with the semi-naked women. Mm -hmm. um, they're not erotic, they're very lovely. Yes. Um, so, as I said, Swiss made, yes. um, with a nice white enamel dial, and a silver gilt case, but most of the gilding has come off the silver yes. now. Yes. It's obviously too much polishing. Yes. Well, it's still a highly desirable clock. 
in this sort of condition, a little bit less than the normal. Yes. But still, every collector in the market should pay between fifteen hundred and two thousand really? pounds. Really? Oh, I'm surprised. Well, that was worth pinching off the shelf well, before we ran for it, wasn't <laughs> yes. it? Yes. Well, thank you very much for bringing it in. I think That's it's fantastic. Totally pleasure. Thank you very much. When I initially looked at this, I thought another writing desk, and they come in quite regularly. But this is something really special because not only is it a writing desk, it's the world's first copying machine. Is it yours? Is it something you bought? It's a colleague of mine. He has a special interest in writing slopes, so we're both journalists. So let's have a look at it. Let's okay. have a look. So open we open up. this, and a standard writing slope. What's in here? A oh, couple of candlesticks. That's right. Go up on there. So. And then, like every writing slope, it has some secret drawers. And in here we have a brush That's it. and a handle. We need that. You need that. <laughs> Thank you. This goes in here, like so. Just wind that. There we go. So what we have here is something that was invented by a Scotsman. That's right. So James Watt. James Watt, you know all about it. Um, and then when he was working uh, between his Birmingham factory and the mines down in Cornwall, mm -hmm. he was travelling backwards and forwards a lot, and he obviously needed to have his documents copied. So the only way to do that would be to write the letter, and he would have sat here writing the letter, and then write a copy, send the letter off, and keep the copy for his files. Very time-consuming. Very time-consuming. Being a great engineer, he thought, I want to find something simple that works, that I can actually copy my letters without having to, to actually handwrite them again. So he developed this, and it was painted back in 1780, uh, and this came into production about 1790. So it's well over 200 years old. And how it works is, although I haven't got a letter, I have got a, a great antiques roadshow brochure here, um, you would have written your letter in a special ink, and then you would have wetted wetted uh, the tissue, and I think we've got some tissue somewhere, uh, probably at this side. There we are, there's some, oh, there's some, some letters here as well. The drying book. You would have wetted the tissue, and then you would have put the letter and the tissue together, put it on here, and then you would have wound the hand. Hopefully it would go in, and inside here there are two rolling plates, and it would press the two together, and you would get offset of the actual letter that you had written in the first place. Mm -hmm. You turn that around, and then you get a fair copy so you can actually read it. It's a fabulous invention. Genius. Absolutely ingenious. Simple, but it worked. Um, and, you know, this was invented way before, you know, obviously, photocopying or even the typewriter. So it's, it's a, an extremely ingenious and beautifully constructed mm -hmm. bit of engineering. Yeah. It's also a piece of furniture. Absolutely, yeah. It's extraordinary that in my whole career, which is, I hate to say it, but it's coming up to 30 years, I've only seen three examples, mm -hmm. one of which I actually handled. And we saw one at Ascot, slightly different design um, earlier in the series. So like all things, you never see one and then two come along together. Yeah. Um, but extraordinarily rare. Uh, I think in the first year, they only made 150. The last one to sell at auction sold for £26,000. British sterling. British sterling, yes. yeah, not guineas, £26,000. All right. The one that came up at auction, I have to say, had a great provenance. Um, and it came from the Watt family, so that added quite considerably to yes. it. But without a doubt, I would see this at auction at twelve to 15000 and it could easily make more because it's in fabulous condition. Wow, well, there great you go. Great Wonderful. fun to use. It's a fabulous piece. Thank you so much for bringing Wonderful. it in. Thank you very much. Well, these are really nice and early Mickey Mouse slides. Um, we've got seven boxes of them, all telling a story. So how on earth did you actually watch them on these funny little um, uh, slides? Well, we used to have a sheet pinned to the wall in front of us and Dad rigged up a sort of slide show by using an inside of a toilet roll and cardboard, a cut through it, and then the slides went through, and at each slide you had a little story to go with the picture. Yes, so 
So you'd be propped up and, and, and Dad would be saying, beneath the bright and cheerful sun, Mickey went out Quite. To... That's quite right, yes. So when did these date from? Um, about 1939, 1940, at the beginning of the war, when the bombing started, we three children slept in this cupboard under the stairs. That sounds comfortable. On the floor. But above our heads used to be books and the toys and the games, all in boxes. And when the bombs came, with the vibration, everything fell off the shelves and onto us. Mum got fed up with um, pencil sharpenings and beads and things in the bed, so we were all moved to the dining room to sit looking at the wall and thus the slides to keep our minds off the bombing. The interesting things about the slides, yes. you have eight stories here, each yes. comprising of uh, two, two sets of slides. Yes. Seven of the eight are Mickey. Yes. And the interesting thing is that they're the early Mickey. This is the, the rat-like Mickey that fell from favour in favour of the kind of cuter version. He's got big fists, um, a spiky nose um, and a tail. And yes. it was felt that he was too rat-like to be cute. So after the war, he was revised into a more sweeter beast. Yes. So there is an extra appeal in these, um, in that they're the early ones. And I think the, the current market is around about £50 each. So the total is probably about just short of £500 for the oh, lot. That's nice. But they'll stay for the grandchildren. I'm sure your story, <laughs> the story that you have about it is a lot more, far more than their resale value. Thank you very much. Oh, it's Thank been you. a pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. This is a, um, a little rectangular blue leather box about three inches wide and on the lid we have the letters M.V. Clytonius, that's Merchant Vessel, yes. Clytonius, yes. launched 9th of the 4th, 1948. Uh, yes. Clearly not by you, ma'am. No, certainly um, not. So who did launch this vessel? Um, it was my great aunt who launched it. Did you but, talk about it at all? I mean, do, do you know well, much Well, um, she did mention it once or twice, but, uh, I mean, I was only about 11 when she died, so... Oh, I see. Yes, but uh, she left this to me. Well, it's quite a small box, quite clearly, and therefore it's not yes. going to have a grand opulent um, contents, but the contents mm. are incredibly pretty, aren't they? Yes. Very what we have yes. in the box is a sweet little bow-shaped brooch. Yes. In platinum and diamonds. Right. Now, the style of the brooch is interesting because, now, can we just come back, reel this back to the year that this launch took place, 1948? 1948. Well, may I tell you that there is no way that that brooch was made in 1948. Really? No, I don't think so. I think that the retailer who have put this brooch in the box have bought maybe a second-hand brooch. And, and they've put it in their own case. Oh. And they've put the, you know, little the motif thing. on the front. Mm. The brooch itself is very strongly of a period of around about the First World War. Now, the diamonds in the frame are what we call pave set. They're in touching formation. But yes. the key to this brooch, which I know it's only very, very little, but the key mm. to this brooch is that when you look at it with a lens through yes. the side, you notice that engraved on the centre at the side mm -hmm. are the magic words Cartier Limited. Right. Now, that's a whole new ball game. Yes. So the value changes dramatically. Now, all right, we're not suggesting we've got a large, important size Cartier diamond no, brooch, no. but I don't know about you, I think it's an incredibly pretty. It is. And yes. wearable. I yes. don't know whether it's something that you wear at not all. Not usually. I wore it at my wedding, but I don't think I've worn it since. Well, I think that such a brooch... Um, if it was sold on the open market, not that it ever will be, no, I appreciate no, that, but I think that it would be value. a lot of interest in it, but actually yes. because it's so small and so sweet. Yes. So what are we talking about with prices here? The fact it's by Cartier means that if you were selling it, it would fetch in the region of a couple of thousand pounds. Right. Nice piece that she yes. gave you. Yeah, beautiful. Yes, I love it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
We are surrounded by a <laughs> cornucopia of Radio Times is here. Yeah. What got you collecting all these? Well, I think just that we got our first television set when I was 10, just in the autumn of 59, and I became a television addict. I loved the programmes of the time, Quacko and Dixon of Dot Green. I eventually managed to purchase four or five of the ones from that time, and uh, it's just kind of grown from there. So uh, how many have you got of them? Around about 300 or so. 300? <laughs> You've got some fantastic examples here. Let's look at this one, Radio Times, 1937. So this is the coronation, is it? This is the coronation of George VI, yes. George VI, uh, look at that. What a fabulous condition. Oh, Radio Times television supplement. Let's see what was on. Here we go. Television programmes, Monday, 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock, close. So, <laughs> so it was only on for an hour. A wee bit limited. And then yeah. 9 o'clock till 10 o'clock in the evening. So just two hours a day. Yeah. Quite enough, I suppose. I wasn't suppose it? in those days, and there were, of course, there were very few television sets, and, and it was only the London area that were really receiving television signals in, in, in 1937. Now, what, what about this one? This is, a, this is an interesting one in as much as it was brought out for the uh, 3rd of September 1939, which was, of course, the day that World War II broke out, and it was never used. The, the, they had to change the programmes, and, and, and everyone's attitude was different, obviously. On Friday the 1st of September, I think, the BBC had a meeting, Radio Times had a meeting, and they decided that they would put another issue out because they were sure war would be declared. So they produced this item, but once this Radio Times, but then once war was declared, it was felt this kind of programming was what, too frivolous? Absolutely, absolutely. So then they brought out another they one. They brought this one here. Oh, I see. So this is the Radio Times once war had been declared. That's correct. That was on, on the streets on the Monday morning, Look at the that. 4th. Broadcasting carries on. Yes, they were, they were really ahead of the game there. Broadcasting carries on, it says here. That is the slogan of the BBC in this hour of national endeavour. Wow. For nearly a year now, the BBC has been making its plans, recognising the part that broadcasting would play in the struggle. It could not afford to leave anything to chance. How fascinating. Oh, look at this. First steps in first aid. First aid. It obviously indicates the, the need for the, for the public at large to be aware of, of, of how to deal with with injuries. It's pretty sobering stuff actually, isn't it? It was a very scary time, I'm sure. And what else have we got here? This is a fantastic trip down memory lane, isn't it? Look, oh. watch how you go, says PC George Dixon, Dixon Dog Green. I think it's my all-time favourite programme. Dr Finley's case book, there's another Sweet. name to reckon with, isn't it? I think that's the very first episode. And you, do, you, uh, do you remember watching that? Oh yes. Oh, my mother was uh, was an avid fan, and well, we all were. And as I said, I watched everything anyway. I, I think I was carried off to bed kicking and screaming, you know, about if there was still something on telly. <laughs> oh, and here we have. Oh, ah. who is this? Well, <laughs> when I knew I was coming along here in the hope of seeing you, I thought I would take a chance and ask you to, to have a look at this and, and uh, hopefully autograph it for you. Oh, me, I'll please. autograph it for you. Yeah, we also have a pen here. Yeah. To Tom. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. In winter time or summer time, or leisure time and pleasure time, the Daily Times and Big Ben Chimes are radio times. You've brought in this interesting piece of pottery to show us a dish, double dish indeed, with handle in the centre. The intriguing thing is who made it. Where are you from yourself? In Buckhaven, in Fife. In Fife? Well, there may be a Fife connection. Let's see underneath. Ah, we have an impressed mark, and it's a very famous name, Weems. You've heard of the Weems yeah, factory? Yeah, yeah. Very well known. It wasn't at Weems, as some people think. It was in Kirkcaldy. The Fife pottery of Robert Heron made it. But the thing that puzzles me is this is not normal Weems decoration. Normally it's very vivid colour, large roses, fruit, very colourful. This is very restrained for a piece of Weems ware. Do you know anything about the history of this piece? It doesn't actually belong to me, it belongs to a lady friend of mine who inherited it in her aunt's will. Her great-great-grandfather worked in the pottery factory at Gallatin in Kirkcaldy. 
And when he retired, this was given to him as a gift. Now you've answered the question, why doesn't it conform to the usual? Obviously, because she worked there, she'd seen thousands of pieces with brightly painted roses. For the retirement present, they wanted something completely different. Weemsmeyer started in 1882, went through until about 1932. And I would guess this is nearer the end of that run than the beginning. So you're doubly fortunate to have a piece of Weemsmeyer at all is, is something these days, because anything with a Weems mark is worth a bit of money. But with the story attached and the unusual decoration, we're here looking at something like three to four hundred pounds. In fact, let's be bold and say five hundred. Oh, yeah. And it'll only grow in value, I'd be glad to know. Yeah, but yeah. being a family heirloom, I would guess you're keen to keep it in the family. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what it should be. It's amazing being up here in Scotland uh, and looking at a watercolour like this because it's like one of the Scottish artists. Yes, yeah, the Glasgow School. The Glasgow yeah. School. At the bottom here, we have a signature, and it's by Johan and an almost unpronounceable middle name, which is Zotlief Tromp. He's an artist that was born in Indonesia, uh -huh. so Dutch East Indies, and came over and studied in Holland, in The Hague. Because he was born in the 1870s, this would have been painted probably about 1910, 1920. But it's extraordinary to find this picture, which is so like the Scottish watercolourist, yes. really, of the Glasgow School, over here. So how did a Dutch painting like this land up here? Well, it, according to my uncle, it was bought by his father, my grandfather, probably in the 1930s. It was certainly bought in Dundee, but uh, we know no more about it than that. I just love the composition. I mean, when you look at it, there's a little girl on the swing there, and on the left here is the sister dying to have a go, Indeed. but she's got to wait her turn, and I think she's rather impatient looking yes. at it. But, you know, when you look at a picture like this, which is impressionistic, yes. look at the way that's constructed. It's very broadly painted, is it? So you have to stand back to look Indeed. at it for it all yes. to come together. But it's so cleverly done. And Indeed. then I have to put a value on this, because it's your heirloom, and I think at auction that would make certainly four to six thousand pounds. Heavens, that's a surprise. I didn't think it'd be as much as that. Well, my uncle would be delighted. I can see him buying a high-definition television now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's rather sad. I think I'd rather have that. <laughs> <laughs> now, quite rightly in Dundee, we've talked quite a bit about the discovery you know, and the crucial role it played in Antarctic history. But there is more to that story, isn't there? And you're from the Discovery Point Museum. Right. And I think you want to explore with me a lesser-known aspect of it. That's correct. I mean, what I have here really is an example of uh, the starting point for Captain Scott's Antarctic uh, career. So what is that? That's a cigarette case? Yeah, it's a small cigarette case which was awarded to him in St Kitts in the West Indies in 1887. He won a cutter race, in other words, an awed uh, rowing race, yes. and uh, was awarded a small uh, cigarette case. The key point about the cigarette case is it happened at a time when another interesting Antarctic uh, character, Sir Clements Markham, yes. arrived on the scene. He was invited by the commandant of the West Indies Squadron and was in St Kitts at the same time. So he saw Scott perform? He saw Scott perform and recognised in him the qualities that he thought might be useful for a leader of an expedition. Right, so Markham was a sort of talent scout. His yes. job, unofficially or officially, was to go round, look at young cadets, trainee officers, and say, he's going far. That's exactly what, what they did. I so that. without that... It wouldn't have happened. Nothing would have happened. No, no discovery. No, we no wouldn't story. have Captain Scott. Oh, we can go home. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So what's the book? The book is probably one of our uh, star items in the collection. It's um, Sir Clements Markham's personal um, photograph album. And mm -hmm. on the first page here, the... The ship that took them all to um, Antarctica, the RRS Discovery, which was built in here, Dundee, yes. is here being uh, so launched. So this is the launch? That's the actual There's launch the ship. on 21st there of March, it is going down the, down yeah, the, down the yeah. So mm. he assembled what? It's like a scrapbook? It's a scrapbook, exactly that, with all of the photographs uh, that he acquired uh, over the period of the National Antarctic right. Expedition. So it covers the ship. What yeah. else does it cover? It covers also... I'll just have to open this up a little bit more. This is a particularly on, interesting no. um, photograph. This is a who's who of Antarctic um, well, they're all in it. They're all in it. You've got um, Scott, Scott in there. the centre. 
You've got Edward Wilson, the yes. famous uh, zoologist. Yes. You've got uh, Lieutenant Roy's Armitage, and then right behind there in Pride of Place is uh, Shackleton. Of course. Who everybody knows. No, you... but what's happened here? Ah, well... Um, William Shackleton, same name, but Different, actually, no connection. But no connection yeah. Was the physicist, the original physicist on mm. the expedition, except he did upset quite a few people within the crew and was decided to take him off the ship. Yes. And Sir Clements Markham, being who he was, decided that he no longer fitted in the expedition, so he just, so cut, he him just out. cut him out. I mean, it's like Stargate. It he is, doesn't it exist. Is, it is. But he's left. Yeah. He's left the body and the legs. Thought or something along those lines. Yeah. But it's, it's, so that in itself is a wonderful piece of it's, history. It as is. You Say, that is Antarctic history. That is, that is the who's who. And what else? All right, just turn it round again. So what's that? This is a particularly nice uh, image lovely shot. of the discovery leaving Littleton, So New this Zealand. is the beginning of the voyage? This is the beginning of the voyage. And Setting off from New Zealand. Yeah. After having been in dry dock, having been repaired, and off she goes. In a trip, really, which is a trip to the unknown, it yes. was like going to the surface of the moon at yes. that time. Well, all those trips were. It yeah. was the last great frontier, It was it? the last great frontier. I mean, I find these so exciting, because I try to put myself in the mind of people at that time setting off on these voyages, knowing they'd be away for years, possibly, knowing no idea about what was going to happen. It's fantastic stuff. I think this is a clear case where objects that superficially have no particular significance are very significant. Yeah. A cigarette case like that without that inscription in that condition is twenty pounds. Yeah, that's right. Add that component, you're dealing with a vastly superior sum, yeah. hundreds. Yeah. Because as you say, without that there would be no polar yeah. expeditions, no. no discovery, no Scott, no nothing. The book is a different issue. It's clearly a good provenance. We're looking yeah. at thousands of pounds yeah. because this is such a rare association of images, material, ephemera, yeah. which tells a very personal story from the person who made it all happen. Yeah. And we yeah. were very, very excited to get it, I obviously. think so. I would be. Thank you. You're welcome. I bet these have pride of place in your dining room. Well, they're actually in my mother's dining room on either side of the sideboard. Right. What do you know about them? Not very much at all. My grandfather bought them, and he was told at the time they came from the, out of the Duke of Hamilton's palace. Right, uh, right, that's, that's a grand start, isn't it? The Duke of Hamilton's Palace, well, it was called Hamilton Palace, but it was sold, the contents were sold in 1882. It's a very famous auction, one of right. the most famous auctions of the 19th oh, century. I didn't know that. Um, these candelabra are clearly, to me, what's called Rococo Revival, which started in popular taste in about the 1820s, 1830s, but for a big, very wealthy, noble family like the Hamiltons, who were in London and buying all the best French things, they would be buying French early revival things in the 1810, 1820s, so, i.e. when he got married, or almost certainly in 1819 when he became the Duke. Mm. Just to explain very quickly how I can date these, they look like French 1730s or 40s, but they're a little bit more clumsy, which takes me to England, possibly, or France in the 1820, 1830 revival period. But the most charming thing, I, have you noticed the dragon? No, I can't you, see it. <laughs> you haven't had a good look at them, have you, ever, really? Just, they've, been they've just always been there. Ga gathering dust on Mum's shelf. Yeah. There we go. But there's a lovely, you can see the tail here, and it works all the way up into the dragon's mouth there. Right. Do you know what they're made of? No. I don't. Honestly, I don't know anything about them. <laughs> Are they gold? I don't think so, but I don't know. Well, they're gold-plated, if gold you like. Plated, they're, yeah. they're what they <clears throat> call ormolu, um, which is actually brass or bronze, which has then had a coat of gold paste put on with mercury, and then it's fired, and it just burns itself onto the brass underneath. They're fantastic things. I mean, they're just great. Well, I think you're going to have to pay, at auction, a minimum of two to £3,000. Really? And I think if you could ever prove the provenance, i.e. the history of them, I think you should double it. Very good. <laughs> I usually talk about military items, war items, yes. but you've brought along a few items today that are anti-war. I have indeed. <laughs> Tell me something about them and who they belong to. Uh, these refer to my grandmother's brother. His name was Bernard Douglas Taylor. And this is him? That's him, yes. Was he a friend? Was he a Quaker? He was a Quaker. The whole family had been Methodists, but turned Quaker before the First World War. Prior to the war starting, he took part in many anti-war committees and so on. Oh, did he? And once the war had started, 
he helped out with other conscientious objectors and so on. When the time came for his drafting, uh, he appeared before a panel and pleaded his case for not having to join the military. What's, what's this handwritten letter about? That's his declaration to the selection panel. Oh, this is dated January 26, 1917. Yes. Um, he's written here, I am not, underlined, a soldier, and no amount of coercion can ever cause me to become an instrument for the slaughter of my fellow man. So, quite clearly, he, he was a very in, intense man and definitely not one to uh, he was, go against his morals. And, uh, whatever else he said to the panel... Uh, they came to the unanimous agreement that, uh, due to his statement and his uh, eloquence and his intensity, that, that he should be fully exempted from military service. Interesting. Now, this photograph here puzzles me somewhat because this is, I guess, him, is it? That's him, yes. But why is he wearing a military uniform? What happened was he decided that uh, the, the help he was giving out to uh, dependents of conches and so on uh, he could perhaps do more, so he decided to go to France to help out there. Was this while the war was in progress? It was still in progress, yes. But what happened was, when he got off the ferry in Calais, mm. a gendarme came up, asked him his business, and when he explained, the gendarme said, what I suggest to you, sir, is that you go to the nearest tailors, have yourself a uniform made, and put it on immediately. Because if the women of France see you in civilian clothes, a young, fit, hale man, they're going to tear you to pieces because their men yes. have been dying at the front and yes. so on. Yes, that's extraordinary, isn't it? And you've also brought along an armband. Tell me about this. I know nothing about it. I can only presume it's part of the Quaker voluntary organisation's motif. Well, in fact, I do know what this is. Um, this is the Quaker Star. I and see. And it's the badge of the Quaker Relief Organisation. That's um, good to know. And so he would have worn the Quaker star on his arm. Well, as far as I know, he had no other form of insignia on the uniform. Yes. So th this, solely this. He would have worn this armband to show who he was, to show that he was a Quaker. Quite. And also, of course, to support the other Quakers who were also over there. Yes, because indeed. he wouldn't have been alone. He would not have been alone. But it must have been the most appalling thing, um, actually, to be the subject of... Um, people's ridicule, because he would have been ridiculed at home in Britain. I don't know that ridicule is exactly the word. I would say disliked, even to the point of being hated. Hated, because hated yes, is because, a strong word. Yes, but the feeling in the country against uh, conscientious objectors, such as he, was very, very strong indeed. Mm. And in fact, if you open that, you'll perhaps this see envelope. what I mean. Yes. What's this dated? 1916, it looks like, from the postmark. Is this a letter to him? You'll see. Oh, oh my, oh goodness me. It's a white feather. It's a white feather, as in the Four Feathers film. It says, Noble Sir, if you are too proud or frightened, underlined, to fight, wear this. And the white And this feather. has been kept. It's been kept, yes. Uh, it was kept by my grandmother just to show the feelings that some human beings have towards others. So. He obviously was a man of great, deep beliefs. Absolutely. But how must he have felt when he received this? How would you feel if you'd received this? I don't know. I think from what I've read of his background that he would have accepted it uh, as an example of how human beings can look upon each other and feel sad and sorry for perhaps for the person who wrote it. Well, that's an interesting perspective, isn't it, I suppose? Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I've never seen another white feather letter ever yes because i doubt whether anybody kept them I, I i would have thought that i think most people would have been very anxious to get rid of them completely very quickly exactly <laughs> i actually feel quite privileged to to be able to see it mm. to, to, it's quite incredible and i wouldn't mind betting that if this was actually sold i'm sure you don't want to do it but no, if, this, I... if this was sold mm -hmm. at auction today you get a number of people willing to pay probably five, six hundred pounds for it mm. because it's most unusual. I think this is an indictment on war itself. Oh, quite. And also an indictment on the sort of person that would have sent that yes. letter. Mm -hmm. but, but the, I, the whole country felt the same way at that time. Of course they did. Mm. Of course we were very patriotic. But I find this, in today's world, I find this very moving. Mm -hmm. Thank you for showing yeah. it to me. Oh.
Thanks very much. This beautiful stars and stripe dress, obviously fancy dress. Tell me the story of it. Well, it was designed and made by my grandmother for my mother in 1926. Mummy was aged 18, but Granny was very thrifty and she was a superb needlewoman. They both designed and made clothes. So you can see how she's used this red and white and blue cotton sateen fabric, cut the red into stripes and put the whole thing together. I think the headdress looks rather like something out of a Lion's Corner House waitress's outfit. <laughs> Well, it certainly looks a bit like Wonder Woman, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Well, <laughs> but I mean, what's fantastic about this is that when I think when I was sent off to fancy dress parties, I always used to go as a pirate or a nurse because it was easy. <laughs> but this is something quite more delightful. Well, I wore it to a fancy dress party in 1981. I wore it with silver lamé Mary Quant tights and I wow. danced the Charleston in it and it was such fun. <laughs> The wonderful thing about this dress is, is that that period, that mid-1920s, mm. women after the First World War, women were partying, they were smoking, they were wearing ma much more makeup. Mummy wasn't allowed to smoke. Mummy yes. wasn't smoking. And well, no nail varnish either. No nail varnish <laughs> either. It's a wonderful example of something from the 1920s, just before the crash. People yes. were still partying yes. then. It got very much more sombre mm. after that. But this is a, a fabulous and just beautiful. Thank you so much Thank for you. bringing it. Evaluation of these things is, is so difficult because really it's a very personal thing. A very, I mean, it would certainly be of great interest at auction. I could see it making 150, 200 pounds. Well, I, mean, I treasure the fact it's still in the family, and I love having it. Thank you so much. Cats and dogs. Yes. <laughs> Don't they look good like that in this group? I've never seen them grouped like that, but I think they do look good. They look absolutely spanking, don't they? That's good, despite yeah. the little holes. Yes, well, yes, the little holes down in this one especially. Have you got cats yourself? One cat. Maybe they played with it or something. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> They're by Frank Payton here. You see his signature. Yes. Done in 1893. So they belong to... They belong to my uncle's sister. Uh-huh. And they apparently were a debt to my cousin's grandfather. But there's no one left to tell the tale. Well, I must say, I think... Um, I think they're terrifically good, aren't they? I think really? so. Yeah. I think I actually prefer the dogs, although they're perhaps not the more commercial subjects, I don't know. Mm -hmm. but, but I like the dogs because the dogs, I think, might be portraits of actual dogs. A lot of other people have said this, just feeling the skin almost. You could feel the skin and the feet and yes. very lifelike. Uh, quite lifelike and, and actually almost photographic. And I, uh, this dog particular, he looks like an aged retainer, I think. Yes. You know, <laughs> and, uh, he looks like a sort of uh, disgraced politician, rather. <laughs> 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 Uh, and uh, he's probably, you know, at the end of his career as a yes. shooting dog. Um, at this, he's a spaniel, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then these terriers, uh, obviously, the, the, the one that's lying down, he looks like a real old fighter, he's doesn't old. he? There's a rather a grizzled, scarred nose. Yes. Isn't there? Um, these cats are rather more soppy, aren't they, you might say? Yes. But then they are cute cats, aren't Look, they? They are cute. Yeah. Um, and so you might even have the three same kittens. Uh, they've escaped from mum and they've come to torment this canary. Yes, the poor canary. <laughs> yeah. Well, they can't get at it because the cage is well closed. So it I, is. I take heart in that, so it's not too much of a cruel subject. Um, but Frank Payton was quite an interesting fella, actually, because he owed all his fame to printmaking. And uh, there was an awful lot of money in prints in Victorian Britain because there were so many um, new houses and they all needed decorating, not too expensively. And people who couldn't afford the originals would mm -hmm. have the print. And it would make you very famous. Right. A bit like if you're a novelist having a film made of your book. Yes. Like that. Um, which do you think would be the most valuable of the four? Um, either this one or this one. The dog pictures? Yeah. I'm not so sure. I think that cats reach a wider audience. Right. Yes, internationally. And he is actually internationally known. Mm -hmm. um, so starting perhaps with the least popular, which might be the uh, aged retainer, the spaniel mm -hmm. here, I'd say he's probably worth about five or six thousand pounds. Right. And then going up to the terrier up here, um, I think it's a really interesting picture. The, the dogs have real character. They and do. A, and, a, and a collector of terriers is probably going to pay between six and eight thousand pounds for mm -hmm. him. And then I suppose torturing the canary would be next. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be something in the region of eight to ten thousand pounds. Really? Oh, oh. yes. Uh, and then uh, by the time you reach the, uh, the really cute one with the kittens and mum, um, 
uh, probably worth about um, ten to twelve thousand pounds. So, all in all, nearly forty thousand pounds for these pictures. Right. Thank you very much. Not at all. Our jewellery expert, John Benjamin, was seen coming off the plane last night at Dundee Airport, staggering under the weight of something very, very heavy in his suitcase. I found out today what it is because we asked him if heaven forfend his house should go up in flames, what two objects would he rush out with, clutching one in each hand? And John, he brought along something. This, I know, is very heavy. Neither of the objects you brought are jewellery, which intrigues me. No, you're quite right. But let's too. start with this one. Why have you brought this along? Um, all right, well, this is a bowl that it's fashioned, it's actually called the Greedy Squirrel. The story behind this bowl was this. Um, when I was 17, I left school. No qualification to speak of whatsoever, really. I was very lucky to get a job working in a jewellery shop located in Bloomsbury called Cameo Corner. Cameo Corner was started by this man here. Let me show you a picture of him. There we are. What's his name? Moishe Oved, the mystic, a sculptor, a jeweller. Started the shop up with nothing, and by the time he died, some of the customers of the shop were extraordinarily important people, including Queen Mary, who had her own armchair in the shop that no one else was allowed to sit in. For the four years I worked at Cameo Corner, this squirrel sat on the counter in the corner, right next to where I worked. When I left Cameo Corner, that, of course, I left, about, I don't know, three, four years ago, the thing appeared at auction, and I was told about it, and I thought, I have to have the squirrel. That squirrel had been winking at me for four years, <laughs> so I bought it. And it oh. weighs a tonne, doesn't oh, it? Ooh. Yes, it does weigh a tonne. I've got to say, John, if you don't mind me saying, it's not the most attractive thing I've ever seen. You don't like it, Fiona. I'm not wild about it, but obviously it means a lot to you. It means a great deal to me because it represents my young life in the jewellery industry. So there we are. And what about this object here? Well, that is a silver sugar sifter. Um, oh, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago, telephone call from one of our branches. Could I go down to visit a local client who it turned out had a large box of jewellery? Went to visit this client. Sure enough, the jewellery was astonishing. And it turned out that the collection was owned by her father. He had made it all. He was called Henry George Murphy. Henry Murphy was a goldsmith and silversmith who owned a shop in Marlborough uh, called the Falcon Studio. And in 1928, up to his death in 1939, he churned out the most amazing jewellery and silverware. Well, how did I come by this? I researched the man's life. We photographed all his jewellery. The client said that up in the loft they had the entire archive of the Falcon Studio. It was a time bubble upstairs. What a find. And what happened was that we recognised, I say we, because I collaborated with one of our own colleagues on the Antiques Roadshow, Paul Atterbury. We wrote a book about Murphy. and. They gave me the silver sugar cast. They, they you, gave it to you? Yes, they gave it to me. And what's it worth, this, do you know? Do you know something, Fiona? I don't care what it's worth. I have something that means a great deal to me because that is a thread in my life. And for me, that is a very personal piece. John, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. This is the kind of thing I could only have dreamt would have arrived at my table today. Here we have, perhaps, uh, how can I say, one of the legends of golfing history. And this is old Tom Morris. Can you tell me where this came from? It was um, in my father's house after his death, and when we cleared, cleared the house out, uh, we found it. Right, so it wasn't hanging on the wall? No. OK, well, let's talk about old Tom Morris, because essentially here we have here uh, a superb photographic image of old Tom Morris. And he's on the course at St Andrews. He's in a bunker, which actually, to be honest with you, is probably not uh, that usual for old Tom Morris, because old Tom Morris was an exceptional golfer. He was regarded as absolutely invincible on the course. He actually won the Open at Presswick four times, starting in 1861, I believe. And here he is at St Andrews. There's a slightly more poignant history to old Tom as well, because he had a son, young Tom Morris. And young Tom Morris won the Open four times as well. But the sad thing is that he died at the age of 24. 
So, we have two generations of a family, both exceptional golfers, both exceptional Scottish golfers. And old Tom here lived to, I think, around about 1904, 1905. Sadly, his son died in around about 1875. And it's a very poignant story, but added to that, we have a man here who, to collectors, is literally the god of the golfing world. And what is more, we have a signed photograph yes, of him. Yes. And I wondered, had you ever considered a, a, a value on this photograph? No idea. No. Well, this picture is worth two to three thousand pounds. I've been offered a thousand for it. You haven't been offered enough. No. Um, because it's an absolute classic of its type. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with, with you, to come to Scotland and find it in Scotland yeah. has kind of made my day. That's what I thought it would, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's great. Thank you ever okay. so much for bringing Thank it along. You. This bowl, I love it. Good. I really, really love it. It's fantastic. It's a visual feast of best pottery folk art you can get, really. It's, it's a gorgeous thing. Everything's going on. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's lovely that it's dated, 1862. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's that? I don't know, but I loved the fact that the, the top hat was coming off. I mean, it's extraordinary. Man in a top hat on a bucking bronco. Yeah. It's an assortment of random images. We've got this wonderful steam train here. We've got two ships. It's a fantastic slipware bowl. Mm -hmm. Technically about slipware, it's pottery, which is then coated with a very, very thin layer of another coloured slip, right. which is basically liquid clay, which is then carved into... And with the, this graffito effect. The history of slipware yeah. goes right back into medieval times. This being a 19th century piece, it became popular throughout, really, the UK. North Devon is very, very famous yeah. for slipware, Barnstable and so forth. Um, but we're up in Dundee. Yeah. Where did you get this one? This I found in my mother's attic when I moved my mother and father to a, a, a smaller home this year. And Margaret Moran was my great, great aunt. Oh, fantastic. Mm. So this has gone down from person to person to person. Yeah, it has and lives in the attic. It was in the attic. I think I shall be displaying it now. Would Margaret Moran have made it? Have designed it? It's very unlikely. It's more likely it was made perhaps as a present for her birth. Oh, for but her birth. But, I mean, your family records may be able to tell you something about her. I need to look into it. You need a genealogist I in, do. In, in the family. I do. I think it's a gorgeous thing. Good. Thank you. Um, I suppose you've got to think about what it might be worth. I suppose in auction, £2,000. Is it as much as that? Oh, goodness. No, I had no idea. No idea at all. Just thought it was a, a family yeah. piece. It's great. It's lovely. It's Good. really, really nice. I'm I, sure I shan't be selling it. I covet it. <laughs> Good. Oh well, I'll take it to my home. You could come and look at it sometime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. The first thing I'd love to ask you is what did you have for breakfast? Was it toast and marmalade? It was, yes. It was. It was. And did you turf the bread out of the bread bin first <laughs> before you put the clock in? Did you really? I did. That's fantastic. I love that. But uh, we're not here to look at a bread bin. We're here to look at this extraordinary machine inside. So yes, do you mind certainly. if I take it out? No, not at all. There we go. Well, it's terrific fun. Love it to bits. I saw it poking out of the top of the bread bin and I thought to myself, please let that be what I think it is. And um, it's exactly what I think it is, which is great. So it's called a skeleton clock. The reason it's called a skeleton clock is because the movement plates have been pierced out so that you can see straight through them and you can examine the wheel work in between the two plates, whereas normally with a clock you'd have brass plates and you couldn't see any of the wheel work. So we call this a skeleton clock. So how is it that such an extraordinary machine arrives here in Dundee? Well, it came into our family in the Second World War. My grandfather was a farmer in Dumfrieshire, and a local businessman approached him at Christmas time. He wanted some geese that my grandfather had. Some geese? Some geese to give to his workers at Christmas time. Okay. But he couldn't afford to pay my grandfather for the geese, so he said, I'll give you a clock, on the condition he could come and look at it every now and again on the mantelpiece. And we've had it ever since in the family. What a fantastic story. And did your father have an interest in, in clocks, in horology at all? No, not that I know of. Not that but he had a good of, eye, obviously. He, he was a canny Scottish farmer. He was, yes, he and was. And what sort of date was that? Second War? Yeah, I think it was 1941 that he came into our possession. Was it? Mm -hmm. 1941. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about the history mm -hmm. of it. Um, 
made around 1830, that sort of period. Mm -hmm. um, on the front, we've got a maker's name of R. Hess right. of Liverpool. Mm -hmm. Now, it's my belief that Mr. R. Hess never made this clock. Right. I suspect he was a jeweller, mm -hmm. um, and it was his shop clock or shop timepiece. And it would have been a wonderful looker, and it would have attracted people into the shop, and they would have set their watches by the time displayed on the clock. Oh, right. And a lot of jewellery shops had a shop's regulator mm -hmm. uh, or a shop's mantel clock. And sometimes they showed in the window, but very often they wanted to draw people into the jewellery shop. So they had a, a shop's clock sitting on the, on the table or as a long case lock, and people would come and regulate their pocket watches by it every day or every week. And they were very useful at bringing people in. But what is particularly fun about this clock is the balance wheel that oscillates backwards and forwards um, mm -hmm. just there that has this lovely snaky, which holds the spring which keeps the tension for the balance wheel to oscillate backwards and forwards. Now, the faster the balance wheel oscillates, the faster the seconds hand goes round. Okay? And you can make the balance wheel go faster and slower by adjusting the balance spring, the spring that's coiled down that the snake is holding. But what is even more wonderful about this is the way that the, the two plates of the movement have been pierced out in this lovely geometric design. And when you turn the clock around, it becomes even more apparent because it's pierced out at the back. But it's the layered design that particularly appeals as well. Um, it's just beautifully laid out. And the one last thing that's just really good quality is when you look at the quality of the wheel work, you will notice, I don't know whether you've seen it, but each wheel has six spokes to each right. wheel. Mm -hmm. Now, the average clock has four spokes to each wheel. Mm -hmm. A good quality clock has five spokes but a really good quality clock has six spokes. It's a sign of exceptional quality. Fantastic. Good. So, now, the last question I have to ask you, did it ever have a glass dome? Not as far as I know. Uh, we, we, we've actually had a, a dome made for it. You have? Yeah. Okay, you just didn't, it. didn't bring it with you. It didn't bring it with us. And you, don't, you didn't have the original base with it, it at any time? It wasn't original, no, no. No. Well, that's a shame, mm -hmm. because the original base and the original dome is important to have. Yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. a, just a lovely thing to be able to have with it. And, you know, that's life. They, they break. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my wife will kill me for saying this, but she was dusting some bits and pieces off a shelf and an ornament broke my skeleton clock dome oh, right. the other day. Mm -hmm. And um, she rang me in tears. <laughs> and I was slightly in tears as well. They're incredibly difficult to replace. OK, well, much collected. This is a skeleton clock collector's dream. Um, I'd love to own it. It's a fantastic clock. So it has a market value. Um, from a flock of geese? <laughs> a good deal. I wonder how many it was. <laughs> and they would have gone by Christmas, whereas here this clock is now. Still got it. Um, open market value for this clock. Take a little bit off for the fact that it's missing its, its base and its right, stone. Right, right. Um, but certainly um, a collector today would pay uh, between eight and £12,000 for it. Oh, that's good, good news. <laughs> Thank you very much for bringing okay, it in. Okay, thank you. It's a terrific clock. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. This is probably my favourite item of the day. It dates from 1602 and it's a pearly pig. Well, it doesn't look much like a pig, I can hear you say. But up here in Scotland, a pearly pig is what they call a money box. And it used to be used in the council to find town councillors if they couldn't be bothered to turn up for a meeting. So it must have had a few bob in it. Could probably do with something like this in the House of Commons, if you ask me. Well, now... It's going to the local McManus Art Gallery and Museum here. And our time here is almost up. We've had an interesting and eclectic mix of items, I think it's fair to say. So from the Roadshow in Dundee, bye-bye.